Uh, thanks so much, Ellie. Um, I, I was just uh, um, reflecting back. I have been here uh, teaching for 30 years. And uh, I don't know uh, if any of you here from UMass went to the uh, Chancellor's Years of Service ceremony last, last fall. Um, very nice um, uh, gathering. Uh, they give uh, awards or presents gifts for, for every five, 10, 15 years. So you get like a UMass Boston keychain for five years and an <laughs> umbrella for, for 10 years. And, and for 30 years, they gave us a really handsome uh, uh, wooden uh, mantle clock, which I thought was a really nice way of the university to say, time's running out. <laughs> Better get busy if you want to do something. So, um, uh, I've been, as Ellie said, teaching here for um, now over 30 years. Uh, and I started about 28 years ago teaching a course called uh, Social Attitudes and Public Opinion that was really actually based on my, um, uh, my research interests. Because um, I'm, uh, I'm a political psychologist uh, interested in the, the basis of political ideology and the influences of, of the mass media and so on. And so I developed this course and, and it sort of grew organically as my research developed over the last 30 years. Uh, and so it's been, a, it's been a fairly successful class. Um, then um, when I started using uh, information technology back uh, in, in 1990s, um, I started with PowerPoints and so on, was, uh, uh, which I found really sort of reinvigorated my teaching after 19 years. I was getting a little bored with it and then uh, Bob Rissing, the art department, recruited me to, to start using instructional technology, and that was exciting. And then, uh, some years later, uh, early in this century, uh, I started using, uh, started teaching online, and so developed an online version of my uh, public opinion class. Uh, I uh, digitally recorded my lectures, uh, narrating my various PowerPoints. Uh, developed threaded discussion topics for the, for the various weeks uh, and was able to replicate a lot of the discussion activities I did in real time using uh, uh, Wimba. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that that's uh, embedded now in the Blackboard uh, learning management system. Um, so I was um, maybe a couple years ago um, uh, uh, just watching TV uh, and saw something, you're probably familiar with this. Mmm, <laughs> chocolate. Mmm, peanut butter. Oh. Hey, you got chocolate on my peanut butter. You got peanut butter on my chocolate. Really good. Yeah, I love this. Two great tastes that taste great together. Reese's peanut butter cup. Real milk chocolate. Good old fashioned. So, uh, it occurred to me, face to face, <laughs> online, put the two together. A blended class. I haven't really worked out if face to face is the chocolate and online is the peanut butter or vice versa, but, but uh, it's maybe not that important. Um, um, uh, so, uh, a blended class is a combination of face-to-face -face and, and online teaching. And it occurred to me with the uh, digitized lectures that I had and the various web content, I could um, have a sort of a version of my online class, but one of the dissatisfactions that a number of students have is a lack of actual face-to-face -face contact with the instructor. Uh, there's also some uh, other issues of exam taking, if someone takes the exam online, is that really the student who's in your class taking it and so on. And so uh, it occurred to me that if we combine the online content with a weekly, once a week meeting face to face, that could uh, maximize the benefits of both those teaching uh, modalities. 
Uh, I should mention, too, of course, that, that the, the balance or the proportion between face-to-face -face content and online content can be in uh, any proportion. So you could have, you know, 80% online and 20% face-to-face or 50-50 or 60-40. All right. Uh, mine, well, you be the judge, I guess, of what proportion that's probably maybe around 50-50, but... Um, various issues with that. I'll get back to that later. Now, it occurred to me that uh, this would be an interesting methodology to try, um, but since I'm trained as a research psychologist, I thought, gee, wouldn't it be a good idea to actually evaluate this new methodology compared to the traditional face-to-face -face class that I've been teaching? And so I was able to get a small award from the uh, academic uh, or an academic technology award from the president's office um, when I proposed a year ago for the spring 2008 uh, semester that I taught simultaneously uh, a face-to-face -face section that met um, you know Tuesday Thursday for an hour and 15 minutes and then uh, I also had a blended section that met just for about an hour and 15 minutes once a week and I graded all the exams blind so that I didn't know what exam was from a face-to-face -face class and what was from a blended class so that my predispositions couldn't affect my grading. Not that they would, anyway, of course. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, I started doing, and, and then um, uh, I started doing uh, some data analysis about a year ago in June. Uh, and, or even before I did, I, I realized that a lot of the students had, didn't fill out the questionnaires, they, or they filled them out and didn't put their names on them, and so it was impossible to match their final exam score with the other data I'd collected. And so I um, uh, got, uh, I renewed my IRB cert, uh, approval for this project and taught a, a, a second blended section last fall, and actually I've continued that, and I'm currently teaching uh, a blended section, also all of the, the same course, Psych 335, uh, this spring. I don't have any data on um, this spring because I collect it at the end of the class um, and don't, don't look at it so it can't affect my grading uh, till after all the grades are in. Um, all right, so uh, just to sort of tell you, so I, I you know, realized that uh, again, thinking back 30 years ago when I was a, a young uh, assistant professor, I was, was put on the academic senate. And uh, one particular, I don't remember any of those meetings except one particular meeting where uh, a senior professor, I think in the German department, just made an offhand comment at one point saying, well, of course, the first three times you teach a course, it's always a disaster. And I thought, <laughs> boy, is that great. You don't have to be perfect right when you start teaching. And so I connected that with this and realized that, this, that I was teaching in a new way. This was, in, in, in a lot of respects, a new class. And so it was unrealistic to expect perfection the first time. So, and so I realized it was a process of really learning how to use this methodology in the best way. Um, so I just want to describe my, my uh, process a little bit. Um, I started out just really putting them together. All right. Uh, had um, digitized lectures, uh, the narrated PowerPoints from the online class, uh, and then we met uh, weekly. And my plan was we would discuss the lectures that the students had listened to the week before. And guess what? They didn't listen to the to the lectures. And so I ended up so they weren't able to discuss it any any length or any depth. And so I had to. I ended up often just repeating, just sort of repeating what was in the digitized lectures, but I only had one week, one day to cover a couple days of content, and so it was an abbreviated one. It was not, not satisfactory, all right? Uh, so, and, and I, had, I had developed some um, uh, quizzes, some, it, it, in the process of thinking about evaluating this project. Um, uh, I developed a multiple choice instrument. This was an upper level psychology class I had never uh, uh, used multiple choice questions before, but I realized for this evaluation that would actually enhance that. Because if you want to develop 
advanced levels of thinking about political issues in the mass media, there's a certain level of information, a few facts that you should be able to marshal that you can then uh, be able to think in a more complex way. So that got me to think about what are individual pieces of information about political schemas, about cognitive complexity that I'd like students to be able to learn. So I developed a whole series of quizzes and in the first uh, blended section in the spring of 2008, uh, I gave these quizzes at the beginning of the uh, class, assuming they had listened to the, the lectures uh, earlier, but students would be coming in at different times of the day, they'd miss them, uh, have to get them later, uh, it just that wasn't working. So then I realized, let's make use of the online component because we have online assessments so that students can take the quiz, and so I scheduled the deadline right before the beginning of class, so students, well, maybe an hour before, so students would have to take the quiz on the previous week's material before uh, they came to class, and then I could actually look at their, resp their responses, their answers, what questions they missed, what was unclear from the lectures, and so on. Uh, and so these were required quizzes. Um, <clears throat> but it turned out students really experienced those quizzes as very sort of punitive, plus they, they sometimes had legitimate questions about things that were unclear in the lectures, and the way this was set up, they were gonna be you know, penalized by these quizzes where they hadn't really had a chance to discuss things and so on, and they still really didn't talk in class as much as I would like. So uh, actually, so currently what I've done is made the quizzes just extra credit. So if they do really well on the quizzes, they get some, a few points of extra credit at the end of the, the semester. But uh, discussion, I think, was sort of better, but there still wasn't enough participation. So I'll talk about, remember, it's the process. So I will talk about what, what I'm going to do next fall when, when I teach this class. Um, but so uh, <clears throat> why have I persisted in this? Um, uh, anyway. <clears throat> There are, uh, I've made use of a series of, of outcome measures, all right? So uh, primary one I'll, I'll mention today is the sort of final exam scores in terms of learning outcomes. Um, as I said, I developed a 26 item multiple choice instrument that I've used for each of these now four classes, face-to-face uh, -face in the three blended sections uh, that are drawn from these sort of 80 multiple choice items I've developed. Uh, I also give some, uh, a couple lengthy take-home essays that they have almost a week to, to work on. And then, uh, on the day of the final, I show them uh, a, a news story, an NBC news story, that I taped from the uh, end of the first week after Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. And this was an NBC news story, and they haven't seen it before and they uh, write an essay analyzing what's going on in that news story based on what they've learned in the class. And it's been, and I tell them they're gonna do that on the first day of class so they know that's coming. And I, it's been very rewarding. The students typically do really pretty well, particularly if they've come to class. <laughs> right. Now, of course, learning outcomes are not the only outcomes that we wanna really assess. So I also developed a, a student satisfaction questionnaire uh, that was really pretty reliable uh, for those of you who know about Kronbach's alpha <clears throat> uh, uh, that seems to be a pretty good measure of satisfaction. So a variety of sort of five different questions if they tended to agree with one, they tended to agree with all of them and, and so on. Uh, okay, and sort of assessing the sort of, because you know, learning hopefully should not be about just learning you know, the content of the class, it should be uh, an enjoyable and enriching experience where students feel connected to others as well and you build a learning community. So, um, uh, here's the data, as I said, I don't have data from this current semester, so I just have the face-to-face the, uh, -face section and two, the blended section that was taught simultaneously and then the blended section that was taught last fall. And it turned out there were no statistically significant differences in the learning outcomes from across the, the uh, three cl uh, classes. The, um, uh, the, although the learning was a little bit lower, I think it was sort of average of, I think, 
Oh, I think it was 88 and it went down to 81 and then back up to 87, something like that. But, it, but uh, anyway, so that was, that was encouraging. Um, but as it turns out, <clears throat> um, in student satisfaction, there were some real differences. Um, uh, but it turned out, but so there was in the two, in the face-to-face -face and the blended sections that were taught simultaneously, the students in the blended section, at least the ones who filled out the questionnaire, uh, uh, really were significantly less satisfied with the class. Uh, in the fall, this past fall, the students were less satisfied than they had been in the face-to-face -face class, but that difference was no longer significant. So that was, that was encouraging. Um, now, I should mention <clears throat> that this wasn't an experiment. As, we, as in psychology we say, it was not a true experiment because uh, I was not able to randomly assign students to different treatment conditions to the face or face of the blended section. Students were choosing, making that choice themselves. So there's a whole variety of different background factors, their level of academic achievement, uh, uh, <clears throat> what the level of their academic stress or personal stress in their life is, all of which could affect their performance on the exams and their learning outcome and, and their satisfaction. So uh, before I began any of this uh, teaching and, and research, I went to the um, Human Subjects Committee and got approval to and they, so student still data consent form and uh, collected a whole series of, of background data. Um, and uh, so this was an analysis for controlling for subjects, uh, GPA, uh, uh, and the stress in their lives. And the, the good news was that the significance level, uh, there were even fewer differences <clears throat> in academic uh, outcome uh, among the, the students. Um, uh, the difference overall between uh, the classes in uh, satisfaction between the face-to-face -face section and the blended section remained uh, uh, significant there. It's less than 0.05. Um, but that difference is pretty much all accounted for by the, uh, uh, the significant difference in the satisfaction of the face-to-face -face section and the blended section on the very first semester of the spring. And that difference, uh, there was n clearly no significant difference at all between the face-to-face -face section and the blended section I taught last, last fall, the second iteration that I went through. <coughs> All right, and so those are the adjusted means if you're interested. All right. um, so uh, uh, when you're thinking about what learning outcome you want for the students, typically, oh, where am I? Okay, you typically um, professors may ask, so what do you want students to know? And uh, a different question that I think has sort of oriented my teaching has been, what do you want students to be able to do? And that's, a, that's in, in some ways a very different kind of question that can alter the way you teach the class. And so, um, as, as I said, one of my major goals has been uh, being able to watch the news and say, oh, I see what's going on there. I see those kind of dramatic images. I know what kind of effect that kind of content is going to have. That, that, that students hopefully will no longer be just sort of passive viewers of the news. And this is, uh, I have the, the story, if we have time, if anyone wants to see it, I can play that. It's kind of an interesting story, but it's a little tangential from my talk here. Um, all right, so um, what I realized, and I'm actually embarrassed to say it took me, to admit that it took me this long to figure this out, is that the discussions in the weekly face-to-face -face meetings for the, for the blended <coughs> section uh, were just not satisfying. I mean, they, they varied. Some went well, uh, some not as well. And um, so I realized that when I thought back upon the level of discussion that was taking place in my online versions of this course, it was much more animated. And uh, as one uh, uh, expert I heard talk about um, a blended section said that students can't hide online. That you know if they're participating at all and, and, 
you can require participation posts in a threaded discussion area in a much more different way than you can require kind of almost impossible to require contributions to discussion in a face-to-face -face class. There can be all sorts of um, you know, background factors, um, um, uh, uh, immigrant students who are not confident about their language, that they're going to be ridiculed by the uh, English-speaking students, uh, all sorts of factors that can impact the level of discussion in a traditional face-to-face -face section, which uh, are removed in a sort of threaded discussion area. So uh, I realized and in the fall I'll be making much greater use of this, that students will be required to post every week. Maybe they can take a couple weeks off um, and start off with introductions, which I always did in my online class. But you, harder to do in a big, if you're only meeting once a week, you don't want to use a, a lot of time for students to sort of introduce themselves and they can be embarrassed uh, with a, in, introducing themselves to a bunch of strangers. Um, but they're much more willing to do that in an online context, and uh, I'm going to have them post their photo as well, because I realize as I get older, I learn their names a lot more slowly, and if I'm only meeting them once a week, my, my learn by the end of the semester, I think I've got most of them down. Um, but uh, that will help me as well as the other students connect. Um, uh, and then to use the face-to-face -face sections um, and so, so require um, regular postings um, on the lecture content that they will have, that, that we'll have read, both posting of the, you know, their reactions, thinking about the content in the lectures, and then requiring also for full credit their responses to other questions, to other postings by other students. So to develop, hopefully, a, a more rich discussion and then use the face-to-face -face meetings for more group problem-solving activities. I always remember, again, it was about maybe 25 years ago, as an assistant professor, I took a Ford Foundation seminar on improvement of teaching. Um, and they, um, uh, one of the papers we read was a really good one talking about the Atlas complex, that a lot of Teachers, they say, sort of feel like the whole class depends upon them. They have to hold up everything, give all the lectures, and making the point that real learning can take place even if the instructor isn't lecturing, and maybe even more so. Uh, I don't know what percent of you have tuned out from my lecture already, but <laughs> typically, in a, typically in a class, the percentage is fairly high. People are going in and out. Oh, what do you say? All right, all right. Um, uh, and so having some of my most successful activities in the face-to-face, -face, in the, the, the weekly meetings of the blended class have been uh, you know, problem solving where they've heard about the authoritarian personality and so I describe an experiment that has a variety of different variables and they meet in groups and have to figure out from the content what they know, uh, what, predict what the outcome of those, of that experiment's going to be in terms of both the sort of the main effects and complex interactions. And that's been you know, really very productive, which is difficult to do online, but great to do in face-to-face -face building upon the previous content. All right, uh, I just want to mention, uh, I, I went to a, a near comp conference on blended learning. It was really excellent about a month ago. Um, a great speaker, Alan uh, Aycock, uh, who's at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee talked. They have a uh, they have a very elaborate hybrid learning or blended learning program um, uh, at the Learning Technology Center. Here's the website here. They have a lot of uh, information. Um, uh, and they actually have a program where they come to different colleges and universities and help them set up a blended learning program. We had a, there was a speaker from Simmons College where the uh, Learning Technology Center people went and developed a program for them and then we heard a report of one of their blended classes which was very good and in, and in the, in, the um, 
intervention that they do, the, the uh, program they, in developing courses, they pair a faculty member with an instructional designer in, help in developing the, the, the class. A lot of faculty will have face-to-face -face classes that they've developed for years, uh, uh, and it's not, and, and so the question becomes, what activities and learning activities in your class are best suited for an online methodology and which are best suited for a face-to-face -face methodology. And that's a decision that uh, faculty working together with some instructional designer can make uh, in, a, in a more effective way than either one could, could do uh, by themselves. Uh, let, let me say, I'm, uh, I had a few other points. This is going to be on the web, right, if people want to yeah. check that. Yeah, so I just, just wanted to just, uh, you know, close by, you know, talking about that there's, you know, potential pitfalls of going to a, a blended methodology that it really has to be done correctly and I realize I have to admit one of my first problems was and Alan Aycock talked about this you have to avoid the course and a half problem I had a course initially face to face I thought oh I can add all this extra content in a in a in an online it, then I think it ended up being too much and so I've had to sort of really distill the course more cut out or make optional various different uh, weeks. Uh, and so you have to really sometimes scale down your, your expectations. Um, and you all also then sort of have to, as I talked about, match the content and the teaching uh, modality uh, to, to maximize those benefits. And you have to manage student expectations uh, as well as um, sort of faculty expectations that it's, you, can no longer do, you know, two exams and a paper. That you really want to keep uh, a weekly momentum going, and students have to be clear on that. That signing up for the class means they're sort of expected to do that. But I think there's a, a number of really substantial payoffs. Obviously, it has the potential to free up class time if you have one blended section on Tuesday and another on Thursday at the same time in the same classroom. You've just sort of doubled your classroom space, uh, which is an issue at a lot of uh, campuses. It certainly increases the flexibility for time for both students and faculty. And as I uh, feel convinced in my own case, there's no real differences in learning outcome. Uh, and I think it really has the potential, and I'm going to actually continue to collect data on this to sort of to test that, but I think there's some real potential for really enhanced student learning and satisfaction with the class um, using the blended format. So. Thank you.